You are live? We are live. Right. So. Can you hear us now? <laughs> if we can all put into the chat to let us know if you can hear or see us, that would be wonderful. There was a big green button that we've just pushed. <laughs> uh, that might have been the button to uh, start everything off. You can see a lot of you active in the chat. Thank you very much. Well, hey, so yes, yes, yes. Loads of yes is coming through. Oh, finally. Perfect. Thank you very much for persevering <laughs> with us. Um, don't worry, we have done this before. <laughs> it must have been like a webinar about a bit of technical issues, but thank you very much for, for joining us. Luckily, that loads of comments coming through. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for joining, joining us on a Thursday day. evening for our Landlord Compliance webinar. I am Steve Locke. Um, hopefully, you've been seeing a lot of my emails come through over the last couple of days, reminding you about today's event. And this is this I'm is John. Tom. I'm John Shaw. I'm a managing director here at House Shaw, and uh, together, me and Steve, we've been working together in the lettings world for about six years nearly. So, uh, plenty of experience outside of that as well. But um, Hopefully we can share some golden nuggets and some real bits of wisdom with you this evening. We've got a nice little presentation for you. I think we saw a question, how long is it going to be? We're going to aim for an hour and a half-ish. Um, we'll try and run through um, and deal with a load of questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, but I guess without further ado, because of our technical issue, we've waited long enough, let's uh, get cracking. <laughs> so I'm just going to start a, a quick poll for everyone, please. So. Have a look at the questions in there. If there's any ideas um, or concerns about um, being a landlord, just um, oh, it's not in there, it's come off a thing. I'll, I'll put the poll in as, as we're going through when Steve's uh, discussing something on there. But um, yeah, I'll get the slides going and we'll be on our way. All right, that's on that one. Start. That's it. Right, let's see. Over to you for a second, mate. Yeah, so thanks again for joining us. Just a bit about myself and John. As I said, we've been working together for, for a number of years now. Um, between us, we've got over 20 years of experience, uh, as well as being landlords ourselves, which is something we um, see is really important to, to offer our landlords. We are obviously the degenerate licensing agency, um, and to be able to offer that perspective as a landlord um, to, to our clients uh, just is invaluable, we find, because uh, we've been there and done that ourselves. Um, with wise landlords and HMO landlords as well, so we, we cover the whole sector. So um, HMOs is, a, is a, a wild beast, but once tamed, it can be quite lucrative. So, um, yeah, we dive into all of that sort of stuff. And you, you'll see some HMO compliance along this webinar as well, um, just to, to cover all bases. We've got over 5,000 units let um, over the over our span of, of years doing this. Um, we're all regulated, um, so that's something we thought was really important. Um, so we sell, uh, for what it is, it's sort of self-regulated. Self-regulated. So we wanted to do that sort of our own back. Obviously, there's no regulations that you need, need to have being a letting agency, but we choose to show the quality of agents we are. Um, by, by subscribing to, to the Arla way of doing things. And as you can see, there are tens of millions worth of rents collected um, over our, our, time, our time together. So um, we'll just crack on with the next slide. So that's, that, that's us. Um, what we'll be covering today, Tom will do a little bit of his market update for you guys just to show how, how we're getting on uh, in, the, in the rental sector. Um, the, we'll go over a bit of the cost of living crisis, possession claims, jump into compliance, uh, things to look out for, so top tips and tricks. Again, we'll talk about HMOs, the big buzzword topic, renters reform bills, so we'll show you um, what's been going on in that sort of game, and some up and coming changes as well. There's a special offer for those of you that make it all the way to the end, and we'll do questions. So we'll try and do questions throughout, uh, but as you can see, we're on two different sort of lap swaps. Um, so it may be slightly difficult to do it throughout. We may try and bolt them up at the end and, and go through there. Um, but um, without further ado, we'll go into the market update. Yeah. Straight into our market update. So I don't know if any of you are connected with us on, on Facebook, for example, or Instagram, but we try and do a monthly um, market update. So this is kind of a really question of what we kicked off in January with. Um, it says autumn, but personally, I need it for, to, to, for the uh, for the beginning of this year. Actually, Steve, are these the slides from... No, 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 I need to correct. So, 
it, these are the spring, uh, the early January tithes for 2024. So there's a bit of silent property crash theory with inflation being so high as it has been over the last 18, 24 months and prices not really going anywhere. Maybe there's been a bit of a silent property crash in the background. So everything's got more expensive, but property prices have kind of stayed where they are rather than property prices following inflation or being slightly higher in inflation as traditionally. Um, the, the gap has, has become further apart, if that makes sense. So there's a bit of a theory going on about a property price that's happened in the silent background of everything else that's going on. So I don't know what the crystal ball is saying, but I don't feel personally there's going to be a crash coming up. Um, I think it's something that's happened in the background that's corrected things, and we're certainly seeing a lot of um, activity in the market right now, especially with investors coming out looking for decent deals to put together to create some quality accommodation. Um, inflation is the big thing that kind of steers all of this. It's currently down to 3.9% as of November. It peaked at 11.2% at the end of 2022. Um, and there are forecasts showing that as early as spring this year, so three or four months away, inflation could be set, that, set back down to the government's target of 2%, which would be really good. And imagine the positive impact that's going to have on the mortgage rates that, that a lot of us have been using for residential and luxury mortgages and HMO products as well. So it's going to be um, a very, very helpful thing for those of us are coming to the end of some fixed rate mortgages. Um, that have been lucky enough to avoid all these price and these, uh, these rate increases recently. Uh, five year fixed rate um, for mortgages are starting to dip below that 5% bracket as well. And if you've got a chunkier deposit and you're able to get a 60% loan to value mortgage, you might be lucky enough to see rates as low as 4.3%. Property prices are up or down depending on what data source you rely on, up or down about 1 or 2%. And as I touched on a second ago, there isn't upward trend um, that we noticed towards the end of 2023, which could, could support a bit of a confidence in the property market settling in for the beginning of 2024 and hopefully throughout. So that's a bit of a market update on there. Keep any questions coming in about that. We'll go through those as we go. We just get the property prices and things like that. It goes back to what you say about the crystal ball, doesn't it? I mean, who's brave enough to make a prediction, I suppose, isn't it? So you look at all these different different regulatory bodies and, and agents making making um, predictions, but yeah, who knows? No one's got a crystal ball. Exactly that. Um, it does say autumn at the top of our slides, <laughs> but I do apologise that it's supposed to say <laughs> <laughs> early 24. Um, so uh, I guess it's proof that we have done this before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, rents remain very strong. Uh, the demand for property is mm. is is immense. It, there's 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 loads of people out there looking for property. I guess what we what we would say is it's finding the best tenant, not the first tenant that comes through the door. Um, the demand for high quality accommodation is, is stronger than that people will pay premiums for, for quality accommodation. Um, high demand is pushing prices up. So over 2023, we saw rental increases from year on year of 15%. Previously in 2022, we saw rental increases of uh, 14%. And there are forecasts showing 5 to 7% rental increases over the period of 2024, slightly lower because of the reduced rate of inflation, the reduced cost of mortgages, making it slightly more affordable for people to go out and buy properties, meaning there may be less tenants in the market um, as we progress through 2024. However, affordability, affordability um, is still quite a limiting factor. Uh, the cost of everything um, known as the living crisis, cost of living crisis is having a significant impact. I think we've got some stats on how much people actually spend on their annual salary on rent. Um, you might be quite staggered to find out. Uh, consumer confidence, house prices, rental days are encouraging activity. Um, deals are being done with landlords, investors in the background, on market and off market. Um, we're seeing uh, money ready investors ready to get, uh, get going and produce some quality accommodation out there. Um, and how sure where we are in South Buckinghamshire, uh, we are seeing great activity with investors seeking opportunities. 
Yeah. Those that are brave enough to get out and get in there are seeing some, some decent deals um, ahead, of the, ahead of the market trends. So. Yeah. so, yeah, I mean, we mentioned the cost of living crisis. Um, it's affecting everyone, isn't it? You know, affecting tenants and landlords like yourselves. Uh, but it's good to understand what your your tenants are going through. And ultimately, they're the ones paying paying the rent. So, thirty five percent of the average income goes towards uh, goes towards the rent, um, which is which is quite a high figure, I think, isn't it? It's massive, yeah. Uh, and look at that in London, forty four percent goes up to forty four percent. So, um, yes, yeah, huge amounts of, of their their money going to uh, going to into your property. So we need to we need to protect that. Uh, and make sure that, that your income is also is protected. Um, so, as you can see, that the ONS report says that renters are five times more likely to, to face financial vulnerability. Um, again, which we need to make sure we position ourselves, knowing that position ourselves in in a place where we are still making sure that you're collecting rent on your properties, because ultimately that's that's um, that's your financial. Um, income, isn't it? So, um, mortgage rates um, insist that rents increases. So. Yeah, obviously, as the mortgage rates were, were climbing up and up last year, we were we were having to push the rents up so that we were covering it. I mean, some of our poor landlords had their, their renewals come out of today and they see most of their profits um, wiped out by, by their interest rates. Um, but we were able to jump on that um, and increase those rents for them um, and, and make sure that they're still making profit out of their assets at the end of the day. Um, but again, talking about protecting that income is the services and products that are rent guarantee um, and, and making sure you get the right deposit. We'll be talking about deposits and schemes and, and, and the rent guarantee service as well in a little bit more detail further on. Um, but those are just some of the, the ways that we can protect your income uh, from the cost of living crisis. Um, cool. Um, so we've got a bit of that way. The, the dates on this are correct, we please to hear. So um, we, we did some research into possession claims. So this is in relation to um, tenants falling into arrears or having uh, some antisocial behaviour um, or any other reason for the landlord serving notice on that tenant to be evicted. Um, so when comparing the same data in July to September of 23, to the same to the same period of 2022, uh, the landlord possession claims were up 19% mm. in 23. So there's more more claims being put in um, between July and September of 23 than there were of July and September 22. Of those claims, possession orders granted were 17%, up 17%, I should say. Um, which is showing an improvement in some of the compliance uh, bits and pieces that have been put out there or reasons for, for the, um, the judges to fall in the landlord's favour. And we also noticed that accelerated positions have increased across all actions, 38% in claims. Um, and that's just in England. There's different stats um, for, for Wales and Scotland, but we're purely focusing on English data for our location in Buckinghamshire. Yeah. So take the good with the bad with that one. Unfortunately, yeah. there are more landlords having to make possession claims. Again, essentially because of this um, cost of living crisis, people not being able to afford it, going into rent arrears and then landlords having to make claims to get their possession back. But the good news is that the landlords being successful in their claims is going up as well. So um, not all will do no. no. So. Um, and also um, the time from claim from when you initially get paid working to actually getting possession back of the property, it's gone up one week from 22 to 23 weeks. So from the moment you, you serve over to the tenant, the average time to get possession, get your keys back from, bail, from with the bailiffs coming and getting involved is 23 weeks. So not far off half a year. So it's, it's a considerable amount of time. So imagine if you don't have protection in place to uh, cover you, during that period of especially not really receiving rent. Um, and also there's a, there's a slide later on um, just about kind of protecting yourself in the first instance to make sure your possession claim doesn't get thrown out of court in the first instance and have it start all over again at more time and more cost. Um, so possession claims, so making sure all your paperwork is in order. We're gonna go through a bit of that um, in the current slides. But make sure you read and understand everything so you can be prepared for any questions that you, you may be challenging. 28% of all claims in that period last year, July, 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 September, 
20 percent of all of those claims are thrown out of court oh. and that'll be for reasons most likely like down to non-compliance so if there's a missing document that wasn't served if there's proof of something that, that should be there that wasn't if there isn't no evidence of that, that, that being served then those are the reasons that most national orders will get just thrown out um, and then you've got to start again with all that great expense it costs quite a lot of money to get to that point in court um, so you don't want to be paying that twice and waiting all that time over and over again. There's a point to make on that as well. John rightly says about having the compliance right in order, but also you could have all of that in order, but actually serving and issuing the notices, section 21, section 8, which we'll go into in a, sec in a second, actually serving those notices correctly in terms of how they're written, because you can fill them out yourselves. Landlords do can get them off the NRLA. Um, and I had a landlord speak to me and say, oh, the NRLA is it's really, really easy to fill out your own form. Yeah. Well, it might be, but it's not easy to fill out correctly. No. Um, so that, that is also a lot of reason why they get thrown out is because the actual notices have not been filled out correctly. We always recommend using a solicitor to do that to make sure that, that you're getting it right. Yeah, it's a change in landscape out there all the time with legislation. So make sure you're speaking to a professional that, that can provide the information that's needed at that point in time when you're serving a notice. Um, if you are working with an agent to um, act on your behalf in court, you need to have them elected as an authorised attendee on your behalf. So if you're overseas or live far away, um, or just you don't want to be in court with a distressing uh, tenant situation, um, you can elect an agent to be there, um, but they have to be authorised attendees on your behalf. Um, breathing space, as many of you come across what a breathing space is, it's, um, it's, for those of you that haven't, it's a protection for a tenant that uh, basically is, uh, it's, it's a debt relief program, so it can be it can be put in place for any kind of debt, um, so whether it be credit card debt, whether it be rent arrears, um, phone bill not paid, or anything like that, um, you, your tenant can be put into a debt relief program. Um, that covers 60 days of the standard debt relief um, breathing space of 60 days where you literally cannot chase that rent. You're not allowed to. Um, if you have a mental health breathing space uh, signed upon you or, or, or upon your tenants, then you are not allowed to um, chase that tenant for rent arrears for the duration of that mental health period, which could be many, many months. Um, and then once it's finished, plus 30 days, so quite an extended period of time, um, which could leave you in quite a sticky situation, and you're not allowed to issue any notices for eviction or anything else like that during that period of time. Um, we recently um, adopted a tenancy, so this was a, an existing property with a tenant situation that was uh, created by others, shall we say, and we adopted this, this tenancy for a landlord, um, he was basically stuck, he wanted to get the tenants out, um, but he was stuck, the compliance was pretty much non-existent, so we had to work with him and the tenant to firstly create the, the compliance in order to basically um, enforce an eviction or create an enforceable eviction. Um, and then, uh, right at the 11th hour, the tenant got a breathing space signed off. Um, and I see it all over the pause for 60 days. It was just a standard breathing space, but uh, yeah, we literally couldn't do anything. I think in this particular case, she did actually continue paying some rent, not much, but she wasn't paying the full amount of rent, but we weren't able to pursue her for the shortfall or the previous eight months worth of arrears. Um, I think it might be more than eight months, actually. But um, yeah, it, it's, we, we often say the, the the way you manage the entry to any tenancy is is the way it's going to help you exit the tenancy. So if you miss any of the steps and stones on the way in, or any of the documents that you've got to produce, or the procedures and certain ways you have to evidence things, um, if you come up against a problem with an eviction or an awkward exit from a tenancy, uh, if you haven't done all those brief at the beginning, that's, it's going to cause you problems later on. Yeah. Breathing space is definitely one of those things that you want to know about but you yeah. don't want to hear about. So keep yeah. that one uh, up your sleeve, just be aware of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, but also be take caution in, in steps, getting up to, to asking a tenant to leave if they are in a yeah. Um Pushing them just that bit too far, may push them into that room space and then your efforts are, are wasted. 
uh, for the next 60 days at least. So, um, you yeah, know, once, once we're aware of that, hopefully you won't come across it. If you've got any questions about any, anything like breathing spaces or anything else, just just follow your comments and we'll go through more later on. Um, mortgage repossessions, oh, did you see? Yeah, so mortgage repossessions um, compared to the same quarter, um, so again, so we're talking about July to September 23, so uh, comparing that quarter to the same one in 22, um, up 14%. Um, this covers residential and investment owners, um, in particular, the, the investment owners, and that's because of multiple Possible things that you can see there on the screen. So your rising mortgages, it got too too expensive for a lot of people. Um, likewise with tenants, the rent got too high and we didn't have them paying. Uh, therefore, we found tenant, uh, landlords missing payments. Uh, and we know what mortgage companies are like if you ever miss a payment, if you've been in that unfortunate possession, position to miss one, um, they certainly don't let you off lightly. Um, and then, uh, things like self-inflicted rent caps uh, were, were making landlords struggle and paying their mortgages because they can't recoup the rent, uh, they can't increase the rent to a level where they can cover their mortgage uh, and therefore in a, in a negative. Um, so, yeah, a couple of reasons there why um, mortgage repossessions have been going up. Just a bit more on uh, rent caps. So what we mean by a certain fixed rent cap is if you've got a tenancy agreement that states in there that the rent can only be reviewed annually at 3% increase, for example, um, then you can only you can only increase that rent by three percent um, at the end of the tenancy. Whereas we showed you in our markup that in the early slides that rents have gone up fifteen percent. So if your mortgage has gone up way higher here, and you, you can only increase your rent here, then the shortfall is going to come out of your pocket as as the investor. Mm. So by several rent caps, we just we just mean you know, does your tenancy agreement are you operating tenancy agreements with rent caps in there? Because if so, you want to remove them. Um, because, okay, it's a fair clause to, to, to put into a contract potentially, but um, it's more fair on the tenant's paper. What about your rising costs? Yeah, and we want to get rid of those ASAP because of a certain piece of legislation that we'll be talking about later. Um, we want to get those out as soon as possible just before um, we get any caps imposed on us. Yeah. Uh, and we see some of it, like as John said, from the tenancy rooms, we see them largely with landlords that have got ASTs offline. Um, yeah. and things like that. So uh, if, that's, if, if that's you, have a little look um, at your contracts. Um, give us a call if you need some help. Uh, happy to go through those. Yeah, um, I think we've got an option coming up in a moment. If, if you wanted to book in a call to run through any specific clauses of the tenancy agreement, then we'll, we'll schedule that in a, in a mm -hmm. moment for you. Um, and then we've got rent, rent guarantees the benefits of. So a rent guarantee service is it's a bit like an insurance policy, I suppose. So basically, um, it just means if you've got a decent tenant in there that's passed reference to this, but they pass all the checks that, that you would want a, a, a decent tenant to have, uh, they meet affordability, then they can be covered for a rent guarantee, which basically means um, it, on, on our policy that we, we provide to our landlords, uh, if a tenant stops paying rent, our policy will cover that rent payment for 15 months plus three months further at 75% once the tenant has left to allow you to re renovate and refurbish the property. It will also cover the eviction costs as well, up to £100,000. So it's a really valuable piece of uh, cover there for you know, just, just in case. Um, it's, it's, it's hopefully not often used. We've, we've had to exercise it a, a couple of times, but I'm glad to say not more than what we can count on one hand. Um, but it's, you know, we, we, we only use all tenants that have been fully referenced and all of our tenancies do go through fully referenced, uh, fully referenced procedures with all the necessary checks. Yeah. In so, the and, and those are big on um, your single air properties where families, more likely families are in. So you've yeah. got husband, wife and, and three, two kids, husband and wife break up unfortunately, wife and kids stay put, father moves out, you know, they break up and moves out, wife now can't afford the rent. But has to has to live somewhere. The kids need somewhere to live, right? No one's going to take a family free out um, on the streets. But unfortunately, you must have to pay for that. That's yeah. the land. We're not getting any rent. So that that rent guarantee service will will allow you fifteen months of of cover for for the family to either find alternative location, which is more affordable, or um, you know get something in place in terms of universal credit or, yeah. or another job or whatever it is. Uh, 15 months, I'm sure you'll all agree, is more than enough time to yeah. sort your finances 
to that. So. Some, something we did see during COVID as well um, was people losing their jobs. Mm. So they, they've lost their job and they've lost that line of income. They've lost their ability at no fault of their own, lost their ability to pay their rent. So it's, it's not always the tenants' fault, fault and, and, and the control is not always with them, not with the control not with not with you as a land or up to the agent. So yeah, I think that the best thing we can do is, is protect that income as 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 she would really. Absolutely. Uh, a little bit more on the right uh, is, is the SPT versus CPT. So, so that, that is just a three period of tenancy versus your contractual period of tenancy. Now, now these are a minefield. There are so many different avenues um, or, or different sort of flow charts you can go through depending on what your contract is, whether it's statutory or contractual. Um, going down to things like, can you issue a section 21? When you can do a rent increase? What documents you need for a rent increase? Um, all of those can change and they're not always the same. You can do one here and one here or, or not that one there and not that one there sort of thing. So it's a massive minefield and you do need to um, scrub up on whether your contracts are contractual or statutory. Um, there is a subtle but the important difference between them. A contractual periodic tenancy basically just states that after your contract, your fixed term contract ends, it will be going to a month by month contract rolling after, after the fixed term. So you are within a contract uh, to go rolling on there. Now you can have a fixed term tenancy agreement and get them to sign a periodic tenancy agreement shortly before their fixed term is due to end. And that would therefore make you a contractual periodic tenancy because uh, you've got a contract there to say you will be taking up the periodic approach. Um, however, on the flip side, uh, a statutory periodic tenancy is, is if you haven't got that in a contract anywhere to say that you will be going month by month. It is assumed that you'll be starting a new tenancy. A new tenancy will be created. Now, the issue with that, there are a few pros and a few cons, um, but we're laboring on the cons here because if you don't know them, then you could be falling foul. Um, so things like you need to reissue how to rent guides. You Also, there's a gray area about re-registering deposits. Um, and then again, obviously your 30 day re-registration um, clause comes in. You've got council tax liabilities as well if they ask to move out or they, they vacate out without notice. Rather, um, you could find yourself liable for, for the council tax there. Honestly, um, I've got a couple of people saying that there's the, um, some sound quality issues. So um, I just want to make sure oh, you're okay. here before we, before we go too much further. Um, I've, I've just plugged in this bike. Sound quality has deteriorated. Is, is that any better now? I just want to make sure that you can, you can actually hear what we're saying properly. We do have a mic connected. Let's make sure it's turned up enough. Is that better? Is that better now if we get a bit closer to the mic? It's okay now. It's brilliant. Okay. okay, brilliant. Okay. Sorry guys. Thank you very much for letting us know. So to interrupt you, Steve. That's okay. Yeah, no, better better on than just talking to myself. <laughs> okay, cool. It's good to hear that you 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 can all hear us. So just a, a brief recap, just in case you, you missed that. Um, statutory periodic tenancies will be where you haven't got anything in writing or in a contract to say that you'll be going month to month as a rolling contract after your fixed term elapses. And a contractual agreement will state that after the fixed term of your tenancy, you have agreed with the tenant that you'll be going month by month, which is fine. With the statutory periodic tenancy, because you haven't got anything in contract, the others of the law will deem it as a new tenancy starting at the end of that fixed term. So then your tenancy starts again. So all of your compliance things and all of that sort of stuff that you did on the on the way in the first time round would all be up for renewal. So issuing your, your how to rent guides and all that sort of stuff, re-registering deposits. I've put there as a gray area because it very much is. Some people will tell you that you do need to re-register it. Some people will say that, that you don't. Again, it's best because not a solicitor about this. Um, but yeah, just to make sure you, you've got the right tenancy agreement. And we, we have people in place that will be able to um, pull, pull your tenancy agreements apart, which I think is, is the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so just a massive, massive um, importance there in, in making sure you know what contracts you have, seeing whether you've got self-inflicted rent caps. So do you have any, any uh, clauses in there that say, what well, govern how you can do a rent, uh, a rent increase? 
And do you have anything in there that is stating whether you can contractually go into a periodic tenancy? Um, so if if you um, if you don't know that, then book a call in with us um, and, and let us know. So I just need to try because of the technical blip we had right at the beginning. Um, we just need to put the uh, oh okay in there. Do, are you okay doing that? On, on, do us, it's on yours, isn't it? So, yes. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll carry on uh, presenting and while Steve does that. If you don't mind me in the foreground of your camera, guys, <laughs> I'll just make sure I can pop that up for you. So I'll just carry on and um, we'll get that up in, in a second for you. Um, you have to do the, the, the second one as well. Yes. Um, so ge general landlord compliance then, just ensuring you're able to evict a tenant should you need to. You know, hopefully you never will have to, but you know, we, we, were, we were looking through the figures. I think it's 28,000 people were or possession orders were started in that period last year from July to September. So out of all the tenancies across the UK, 28,000 of them ended up with a possession claim being started and 28% of them failed. Um, so it's, it's all about mitigating any risk of a tenant pursuing you for non-compliance. So the, the, risk, the, the risk and exposures to you are fines, damages, potential imprisonments for compliance items that aren't in place. Um, and, and the worst thing of all is if, you know, potentially if you've got, a, uh, certainly if you've got a pricey rental figure, um, the worst one you could get is a rent repayment order, which basically means all the rent that they've paid over the previous 12 months, you have to repay back to them. So that, that book a call link is now on there. I believe it should oh, uh, publish. Here we are. Thank you, Steve. Cool. So that gives you the opportunity to book straight in um, for a 15 minute consultation with us um, just to go over the contracts and things like that and make sure that you've got got the right contract in place uh, for what you need and for what your tenancy sort of requires. Yeah. So um, we'll leave that up for a little bit. That will book straight into our, our calendar um, and uh, we'll, we'll get some in touch basically with you. And equally, book the call if there's something else that we've touched on um, mm. that you want to just call about. It doesn't have to be for contracts. It could be for anything really, um, even a specific ten tenancy issue. Um, so Deregulation Act 2015, so this is some legislation that's nearly nine years old now, um, came out in October 20, 2015. It's all about the documents and the processes that you have to go through for new tenancies. Uh, we've got more on that in a second. Uh, we've got grounds for a, a eviction, so we'll cover that for the part, as part of our general compliance section. Rent repayment orders, which we touched on briefly, and the fire safety changes. Mm -hmm. So if we skim through to the next one now, we'll leave the phone call um yeah tag on there for you guys as well i'll take the poll off as well just in case it's covering the screen uh so thank you very much for those of you that participated in the poll i'll just end that for the time being wonderful so the deregulation act um it, it's the provision of suspending the operations of the section 21 in order to protect the tenant against eviction so it's a protection bit of legislation for tenants really um, and it just basically means that you as the landlord or the agent on your behalf as the landlord has to provide certain compliance documentation to the tenant in a prescribed manner, uh, deal with the deposit in a certain way and, and issue the correct documentation and prove that it's been issued as well. There's, mm. there's one thing saying you've done it. There's <laughs> another thing telling a judge in court that you have, you have done it and here's the evidence of, of how we've done it. Uh, one thing we do here at Healthshore is we do everything with digital signatures. So we send a tenancy agreement and all of the compliance documents and the government how to rent booklets and everything else in one envelope with a digital signature. So it's all there for them to review all at once and then they just go through initial each section and then the evidence is all collected when mm -hmm. they click on submit. Um, Skipping on to the next one, deposits, quite a big subject around deposits, really. So there's deposit protection or there's cash deposits. So you've got a uh, basically an, an insurance backed deposit protection service or you, or you may have heard them referred to as the zero deposit schemes. This is where the tenant pays no deposit, but they pay um, normally one week's worth of rent um, as a fee to an insurance company to effectively cover their liability for that deposit. There's various different options out there. The one we use covers uh, a 10 week deposit liability. Um, and uh, we're finding that's a really strong product and it protects the landlord really nicely. And the benefit, the huge benefit to the landlord is it's double protection because you can only take a five week cash deposit. 
uh, it's double protection at 10 weeks and the tenant pays for the for the policy so it's great mm -hmm. um, and they, they they seem to be a little bit more in favor of the landlord um, when it comes to adjudicating decisions at the end um, the schemes available for cash deposits on the other hand are there's not many there's only three so there's the Tennessee um, deposit scheme the TDS there's the deposit protection scheme the DPS and there's one called my deposits as well they all do a combination of insurance backed or custodial schemes so insurance backed is where you keep the deposit in your account but you register it with them and you pay a, a, an annual fee to um, basically insure that deposit um, the alternative one is custodial which is where you submit the whole value of the deposit to the to the deposit supplier and they they maintain that deposit throughout its duration um, and then when you make it when you either release it in full or make a claim against it at the end they will administer that as well <clears throat> there, there are time constraints for registering deposits so if you have a cash deposit you have to register it with one of the schemes within 30 days um, it's 30 days from when you receive it not 30 days from when tenancy begins um, and with the deposit protection side of things, there's no real time time, constra time constraints on there, but obviously have it set up before the tenancy commences. Uh, there are caps or you know, changes from five weeks to six weeks worth of uh, deposits. Um, <clears throat> when you go from a 50K, 50,000 pound annual rent, you can, you can collect more than, you can collect six week deposit cash amounts. Uh, anything less than that is is the statutory five weeks worth of rent. Uh, there's penalties for non-compliance, and those penalties could end up with you being told by a judge that you need to repay the tenancy deposit in full, mm -hmm. three times the tenancy deposit as compensation, plus the tenant's costs as well. So if you haven't protected that deposit uh, properly, administered the certificate and and the prescribed information, uh, then you could be told to. To, to repay all of that to the tenant, regardless of if they've left the property in arrears, regardless of if they've left it in a in a bad condition. Uh, so just make sure you handle those deposits properly. We came across uh, some deposits not so long ago where they were protected, but I think there's, there was three or four of them in total that came to us with this one landlord, um, again from others, should we say. And the, the, the vast array of them, were, well, they were all non-compliant, um, some of them were too much money, more than five weeks worth of rent. All of them had been registered outside of the 30 days. One of them was registered two years after the tenancy started. I don't know how it gets that bad, mm. but uh, yeah, I mean, if, if the tenant knew the law and they challenged them on that, that's, that's the end of it. You know, mm. they, that, that's that deposit it has to be paid back in full, plus the compensation, plus the tenant fees as well. Um, and if you haven't protected your deposit, guess what? If you need to go to court and apply for a possession order and a judge finds out you haven't protected the deposit properly, then you'll be thrown out of court and you have to start again because it will invalidate your possession claim. Mm -hmm. and, and a good good point in going back to um, serving Section 21s and Section 8s, is a good thing about using a solicitor as well is that they will, it's, it's another barrier before you get all the way to court. Mm -hmm. They will help look at things like like the deposit and uh, they won't, they'll, they'll actually advise you if you've not uh, protected your deposit, they'll say you have to give that back to the tenant before we even proceed. So, yeah. so we, we can, it can lend itself in a favour sometimes, but yeah. it's like, oh, almost, you know, there's your deposit, out you go kind of thing. But it's something you need to be aware of that, you know, solicitors won't even serve you with Section 21, Section 8 if you haven't protected your deposit and you will just, you'll relinquish that straight away. Yeah. Um, we, so, we work quite close to some legal advisors mm -hmm. to, to make sure that we're, we're providing the best advice that we, we need to when we get to that point. Absolutely. Um, often when, when you've got a tricky situation, it's, it's all about strategy. You know, it, it's a communication business property. It's a people business. You're talking to people all the time and it's all about strategy and how you kind of outlay that to, to the tenancy to, to make sure that you can, you know, create a win-win situation. We don't, we, don't want, we don't want anybody coming away hurt from a situation like this. Could you just go back one? Uh, yep. Wonderful. I just wanted to touch on the how to rent guides very quickly yep. because we've got a lot of people we had of uh, spoken to a few landlords in the past that don't really know what these how to rent guides are um they're government issued 
there's a lot of them. Um, and if you don't know what they are, um, you, you kind of need to get to know. Um, and you need to serve every single version of these how to rent guides for the duration of how long your tenant has been in there. So if you've got a tenant that's been in your property for three to four years and you don't know what the how to rent guide is um, or never served one, you need to go back four years, find all of the ones that have been issued. And there are quite a few um, from now between between now and four years ago. You need to serve those all on that tenant and then keep up to date with the with the frequent how to rent guides that are um, that are issued. The sad fact of the matter is nobody reads them, probably. No. Um, but you have to serve them, unfortunately. There were two released last year, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, is that, have we missed a slide? No, that's fine. Right. There we go. So right to rent. Um, right, right to rent is, is the government telling us as landlords and agents uh, to basically work for them as border <laughs> control um, and make sure that everybody has the right to rent under the Immigration Act of 2016. Um, it, it means that we have to check that everybody um, in the property um, is over, well, everyone paying the rent basically, or everyone over the age of 18 needs to show proof of rent, uh, right, proof of their right to rent. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and we can do that via various uh, original documents, um, checking and, and bits and pieces like that. If, if People don't have a UK driving license or passport, for example. There's other documents that we need we need to see, um, and and ultimately uh, you can check this out on the on the government section of the website, and it will give you a bit of a flowchart of what documents you need to be looking at if um, you end up in a situation like that. Um, copies need to be kept, so you keep a copy. Um, make sure you've got some kind of evidence that you've seen the uh, original document. Uh, we, what we do is we 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 um, request a copy of their original documents at the point of application, and then we request to see the original document in in person. You have to see it physically. You can't just rely on an email being sent across because it could be a forged one. But you have to physically see it as well, um, and we we request to see that when we physically see the tenant, either for a viewing during the referencing process or at check-in. They will not be allowed to check into the property unless they prove their right to rent that property. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you've got any questions about right to rent, I think I've still got the book a call um, icon up there, so please do help yourself to put that call. And it's just important to note about the, the follow-up as well for a right to rent yes, check. So that, yeah. when, your, um, when your tenant moves in, if they've got a, remain, uh, a time to remain, um, you do need to look at a follow-up uh, check-up. You need to follow up with a check-in to the tenant, um, whichever is later, either 12 months after they've moved in or whether, whenever their right to remain expires. It's a bit of a strange one, that, isn't it? It's whatever comes afterwards. Yeah. So if they've got four days with the right to remain, you can, you can move them in uh, on a 12-month tenancy and you don't have to check it uh, until the end of that 12-month tenancy. Um, so it's a bit of a bizarre one, but uh, yeah. make sure you are doing those follow-up checks anyway. And guess what? If you don't, <laughs> you could be fined up to £20,000 by the government. Uh, you may have saw effective of, I think it was the 25th of January, so not very long ago, a couple mm. of weeks ago, they uh, they ramped up the fines. Not even, they, they, they more than quadrupled them in some circumstances. So it used to be for your first offence, it was £1,000. Um, that's just gone up to £10,000. For your second offence, if you have a second offence of um, not carrying out your right to rent checks, um, and it's, it's courts and, and and you're caught and you're prosecuted, then your second offence could see you a fine of twenty thousand pounds now, up from three thousand pounds. So that's more than six times the it's original crazy. amount. Yeah. Plus, for severe cases, you could get some prison time as well. So it just goes to see. It just goes to show how much. The, the government is putting on other people to, to kind of do this for them. Mm. I guess, you know, the, we, we are dealing, as, as landlords and agents, we're dealing with a greater amount of the population than just the government can do in, in one instance, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, it's obviously quite a serious matter for them to slap a £20,000 fine mm. just for not checking yeah. the ID documents or someone. Uh, I suppose it yeah, poses the question, where, where are you getting your tenants from, doesn't it? It's an important question to, to see where you're, where you're getting tenants from because different portals will bring in different type of applicants. Um, so things like 
Gumtree, for example. Um, we've, we've met a few landlords that, that like to get their tenants from Gumtree, um, but those are probably the ones that you need to be doing the checks on more so than, than people that are coming from right move. That's not to say that that, that shoe fits everyone, um, but yeah, it, it is, um, you've joined the room. I'll turn your pen on. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, it's just important that you, you look where your, um, where your tenants are coming from and making sure that you're doing all of the checks um, throughout that process. Cool. Um, oh, I, I clicked on a link for the. For, I saw Natalie was asking a question about where to book the book the call. Um, I've just been ejected from the. Okay. <laughs> I think it's all the now, Steve. All righty, all righty. So don't click that that green button. Is everyone? We are in the chat. Found it. Link okay, Natalie. Well, <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> in in trying to find the link for you, I've ejected myself from the presentation. <laughs> but uh, it's okay. We we <laughs> you now. Uh, uh, so you can still do next on that one? I don't think I can. I think I'm, I'm disconnected now. Oh, no. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. All good. Okay. Problem solved. So, um, can everyone still hear us? I haven't ruined that at all, have I? <laughs> Before we go on to rent repayment orders. Just give us a, a thumbs up, a yes or a no, if, if, if you can hear us. I just want to make sure I haven't created any more technical issues. Yeah. I think we'd have a mass exodus if we had any. I've found it on there. Yeah. Yeah, I am reconnected. Just to... Reconnected. Yeah. Oh, we're all good. Thumbs Thank up. you. Thank, Thank you very you much know. for that. Lovely. So, Good rent opinion. repayment orders. Um, so, tenants can, pl- tenants can apply for a rent repayment order um, if their landlords mm. fail to comply with compliance. Generally, this would relate to licensing of, of a property, for example. Uh, but it can relate to other compliance issues mm-hmm. as, as well. Um, so not complying with improvement notices for property. So if your property is in, if a property is in pretty poor condition and the tenants are complaining to the council, which they can do, the environmental health department will come out, inspect, and um, more often than not, they will slap a, an improvement notice on there. Um, normally, it gives you a bit of time to make sure you carry out those improvements. Um, at your cost, you can't pass the cost, cost, cost on to the tenants. Um, so, so yeah, just keep keep an eye out for main, making sure the property is safe and fit for purpose. Um, illegal evictions as well. So, if you change the locks on your property to make sure your tenant get back can't get back in, um, that is considered an illegal eviction. So, I know it's tempting if someone's not paying their rent for a, a vast period of time or they're not respecting the property. Um, but you cannot change the locks. You cannot get the boys in to get them out. You cannot do any of that. It will be classified as an illegal eviction. Mm -hmm. You will have to let them back in and you could be slammed with a rent repayment order. Um, A breach of a banning order, we'll see you with the same thing, a prohibition order. We were trying to say that word earlier on. I think (laughs) I mastered that. Um, Operating an unlicensed property when it should be licensed, such as an HMO, for example. Um, would see a rent repayment, rent repayment order being slap, slapped on you as well. Um, it's for a maximum of 12 months rent. So for the previous 12 months, you will be um, ordered to pay that rent back. And if you have an HMO and one tenant gets wind of what's going on with a rent repayment order, mm-hmm. guess what? They're going to go back and they're going to tell all the five, six, seven other tenants that they live with that they've just managed to get a year's worth of rent back. And then you can only guess what's going to happen next. Absolutely. Yeah. With the uh, legal evictions, you might be sat there thinking, oh, well, what, what a silly one that is. But trust me, when I've, we've met loads of landlords, that when it gets that level of frustration, you know, or desperation to get some tenants out, mm-hmm. it, it's an option for them. But it, it's, it's always the wrong thing to do. And it's simple things like not getting the keys back. So you mm-hmm. might be looking in the, in the window and saying, hey, look, there's no furniture in here. I haven't spoken to my tenant. I haven't got a surrender of tenancy. They haven't yeah. said that they're moving out. Um, but look, there's no furniture in there. And your main thing is you haven't got the keys back. So you'd be forgiven for thinking, oh, my tenant's definitely moved out. They're not living here. But without that surrender of tenancy, without those keys back, yep. if you're going in there, they could come back two weeks later and 12 months of rent back in, back in their pocket. Exactly. And, and with, with, the, with the internet now and everything's at the end of everyone's fingertips, Tenants are getting smarter at this sort of, yeah. sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so you, you need to be aware of these kinds of things as well and protect yourself. If, if you are suspicious that your tenant has left the property and they haven't given you the key back, they haven't given you anything in writing to suggest that they've moved out, 
um, then you have to go through a, a something that's called an abandonment notice, which is a um, it's a prescribed method of delivering notices to the property in a in a particular time scale and in a particular manner as well. So um, if you are unsure about that, you need to investigate an, an an abandonment notice. But it's not just one notice. I think you have to slip um, a half a dozen or so notices, not even under the door. You have to stick them on the middle of the door, bright, obvious um, font and everything else with the right right wording as well. So, so that's what you may need to consider if you're worried about uh, a, a tenant that you think's left. Um, we actually got tr nearly tricked. We had one landlord come to us not so long ago, just before Christmas. Um, he was like, oh yeah, I've, I've had a tenant move out of the property. Uh, can you go over there and change the locks and then and re-let it for me? Um, so yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're a letting agent and we manage properties, of course, we're gonna have a look at doing that for you. Um, so we went over there and it clearly was being lived in. So, and, and we kind of learned afterwards that there was a bit of a slippery slope with um, what was going on with this particular uh, scenario. But I won't elaborate any more than that, but it, it, it's just something you need to be aware of. And That's um, it, you can't you can't make people homeless effectively is what this is uh, protecting mm -hmm. against. Uh, grounds for possession. So there's quite a few grounds uh, for possession. So you've got section 21, which is the so-called no fault or no, uh, yeah, non-fault eviction. Mm -hmm. um, you need to serve two months notice, um, but you can't do that before six months on an AST. So if you've got a six month minimum term AST, then you can issue a section 21 at four months if you want somebody to leave. Most tenancies are about 12 months, which means you can't issue a section 21 until month 10. Yeah, and which is which is always um, one, to, one to think about as well when you get tenants looking for three to two month tenancies yeah. and you give them an AST, well, automatically you've given them tenure for six months. So if you've only agreed three months of rent and then their mind, they're going to pay that, but then they know about this, they can stay in there three months and you can't get them out until six. Yeah. And they haven't paid rent for it. Obviously you can recoup that, but you know, why put yourself in that position in the first place? Yeah. Um, so always be wary of that as well. Yeah. Well, if you've got a tenancy that's, that's been proposed by a tenant um, with them, it, it, it displaying a, a, a vast amount of knowledge of the law and legislation, uh, just be careful in case they're trying to catch you out. Mm. Um, section eight is, is the other type of notice that can be served upon tenants. So this has discretionary and mandatory grounds for breaches of tenancy. So section 21 is when you just want to ask the tenant to leave. Section eight is when they've breached the contract, either through rent arrears, um, antisocial behavior, um, through other problems in the property or with the tenancy, there's, there's, there's discretionary and mandatory grounds and you have to state what those grounds are as part of the notice. Um, if you serve a section in it for rent arrears, for example, and it goes to court, the tenant can turn up on the day with cash, for example, or having made a bank transfer to you, paying off the arrears in full, which means, guess what? Your possession order will be thrown out of court because it's no longer valid because they've paid the rent arrears. So sometimes, or what, what is quite often advised is if you have a tenant in rent arrears, issue them a section eight because it's an accelerated uh, possession procedure or route, I suppose you could call it. Uh, the section eight will gain you the uh, possession quicker. If they play funny games and turn up and pay uh, the rent arrears off, at least if you've served the section 21 at the same time, you can fall back on that when that's, um, when, when that notice becomes valid, um, hopefully a couple of weeks afterwards. So just, just bear that in mind. Eviction is, is a bit of a minefield. Doing it properly is, is the only way because you're gonna get tripped up uh, by a judge if, you, if you've cut any corners. Um, I suppose it's a good point to reference the, the land or refuge service that we've done yeah, previously. Okay. So, um, we do find landlords that are in, you know, they mean well and they've just ended up in a position where they've laxed, uh, they weren't keeping up to date with their compliance, they don't know about the how to rent guide, didn't know about EICRs um, and things like that, and got themselves in position, and then now their tenant's not paying rent. We do run a service where we link up with solicitors, um, and maintenance people, and all that sort of stuff, and we, we get in, we, we strategize, like John said earlier, we strategize their exit, um, we onboard the property um, and we get it compliant. Because usually you won't, you'll go to an agent and they won't take on a property unless it's compliant. Um, so we, we do have a service where we can take that on, get it compliant, 
and get that tenant out or, or fix the relationship with, with the tenants. You can call it the landlord rescue. Um, again, you've got the link for the book of call. If you want to talk about that, um, then there's no shame in, in getting that sorted ASAP rather Absolutely. than letting rather than it. Yeah, right. don't, don't be an ostrich and put your head in the sand. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to hang on this on this slide for 10, 15 seconds. Um, if you want to take a screenshot of it, these are the mandatory grounds for possession of a Section 8. And it gives you the um, the notice periods on the right hand side as well. So I'm just going to hang there for another five seconds. Take a screenshot of that. And on the next slide, OK, three, two, one. The next slide, these are the discretionary grounds for possession under a section eight. So we'll just hang on here for another um, five, 10 seconds or so. But those are all of the reasons that you can give under a section eight to evict a tenant. If you've got any particular concerns about them or any, yeah, any specific details about that you want to talk about in a bit more detail, you know what to do, book a call. Okay, fire safety now. Um, from the 1st of October 2015, mm -hmm. you have to have a fire fire alarm or smoke alarm um, on each habitable floor of a rented property. Yep. Uh, currently, these can be battery operated, but we are seeing likely reasons for them to, this to be changed to mains powered, battery backed up and interlinked as well uh, throughout the property. Um, you may see different regulations uh, from building regulations. So I think building regulations for new properties, um, the, the regulations in building regs state that fire alarms should be mains linked. For existing properties that have been around for a few years, let's say, uh, the regulation is battery operated. However, I just think safety, compliance, the way it's all going, belt and braces, it, it's if you're doing a refer for a property or, or something like that between tenancies, um, I don't, it's not that expensive to install uh, mains linked battery backup. Um, June has lost the sound, she's saying. Hmm. June, have you put yourself on mute? Have we done anything? Um, can anyone else hear us? I think there's a bit of a delay for the typing come through the chat. Okay. So just bear with us, guys, whilst we make sure that everyone can uh, can enjoy the webinar. If anyone else is having issues with sound, please, please let us know. Let's just check the settings. Jay, good to hear that you can still hear us. Yeah, that's lovely. Well okay, done. thumbs up. So June, it might just be... Might just be your end, June. I'll, I'll just... Uh, do you want to carry on that slide? I'll just type a message to June. Yeah, cool. Cool. So, um, yeah, so just catching up, uh, carrying on from the fire alarms and all that sort of good stuff. Um, they should be about, they should be proved uh, at the start of tenancy that they're working. Of course, um, we itemise that on our on our inventories um, just to make sure all is all is good with that. Um, and we actually also do them on, on every inspection. Um, we've we found that that's that's quite a good point to to make reference to. Quick video, um, date and time whilst you're you know. I'm here at X property on X road at X date, um, and then and touching the fire alarms and making sure they're work. Trust me, that will save you a lot of bother should you ever need that proof in the future. Um, the single let single let um, tenants should definitely take responsibility for changing their batteries throughout their throughout their tenancy, um, and uh, make sure that they're checking them regularly. Obviously, when you do book in an inspection whilst you're there, you may as well do it so that you can prove to yourself and to anyone else that they work. But yeah, during the lifetime of the tenancy, it's certainly the um, the tenant's responsibility. Uh, whereas HMO tenants, the it's the landlord's responsibility. So we'll cover that in a bit more more detail in the, in the future slides about the HMOs. Yeah. Uh, if the tenants are replacing batteries, it must state this in the tenancy agreement. Yeah, I mean that's a pretty simple sort of statement. But yeah, make sure if you've got if you're adding any obligations to the tenants that it's all itemised in tenant obligations in your in your tenancy agreement. I'm just going to create another poll um, for you guys as well because there's quite a few of you here. Um, just a quick question, if you're an HMO landlord mm. or a buy-to-let uh, landlord, I'll just look, click over to the next slide for you, Steve. Cool. So the, the fire safety uh, amendments of October 2022, uh, all rental properties now must provide a carbon monoxide alarm uh, near a uh, combustion appliance. 
that is excluding your gas gas cookers. Um, I believe it's the two meter range that you need to have um, if you're if it's on a habitable sort of floor in your in your property. Um, Five thousand pound penalty for for not for not putting one of those in. And what are they sort of fifteen? 20 quid, 25 quid, something like that. A couple of quids for the the contractor to go and put them in. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, If you, um, yeah, for for the sake of a five grand fine, you'd you'd spend 25 quid on a a car box alarm, definitely. Exactly that. Uh, Contractors. So um, as as a landlord, uh, you must have had dealings with contractors to deal with maintenance property, uh, maintenance issues at your Mm. properties. I can almost guarantee that I would have thought. (laughs) Um, but do you check their public liability insurance? Do you check that they're qualified to do the gas or electrical works that they are um, that you are paying them to do? Do you um, do, do you check their risk assessments and method statements, their RAMs? Um, failure to do all of these things could leave you or your tenant safety um, exposed. And and guess what? As you organise the work, you are considered the project manager and um, you'll be held liable for that. There is a bit of case law on this. If you want to look at this later on, if you have a quick Google of MMP versus Jarry 2012, uh, this is where a, a letting agent got fined actually for instructing a handyman to go over and fix, um, I think it was a carport, one of those corrugated perspex carports, a, a crack or something like that. Um, he was on a very short step ladder, he fell, whilst he was fixing this uh, this item, uh, banged his head and he sadly passed away. Um, the family uh, su- sued, for, sued for damages and won, and the estate agency ended up having to pay out £86,000. Uh, so, and all because, you know, if they had a piece of paper to say that this guy was competent at working at heights and he knew his, self, his health and safety, um, he knew how to work safely, um, that, that would have basically been what they needed. That would have been what they would have needed to mitigate that liability. Um, but you know, also, I don't know if he had insurance on that particular item either. So just if you're, if you're working with contractors, make sure you know that they're compliant. You know, if, if they shouldn't have a problem showing you their insurance documents, mm-hmm. they should be almost used to it. Some of the contractors we work with, you know, on their websites, they have a link on their website, view all of my compliance documents. If you can go on there, you can see all of his certificates, all of his uh, insurances as well. So it's a very big thing to be aware of. And it's definitely good to get their um, their qualifications because I think certainly with gas, uh, you have to be a certain level of registered to do the yeah. boiler and the gas one yeah. as well, don't you? So you may get someone that's um, compliant in one, but but not the other um, that you've been getting to do to do both the entire time. However, may not gas fires as well. Gas fires, that's yeah. it. Yeah, back boilers as well and things like that. So um, yeah, 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 keep an eye on all that sort of stuff. Um, other things to look out mm-hmm. for: legionnaires. Uh, the number one place for legionnaires to, to pop up is so so it's a bacteria in water, and it appears in in water that gets hot and cold. Um, in in the hose that comes out of the shower. So you get hot water coming out when you're having a shower and you you stop the shower and it gets cold. Um, That's the number one place for Legionnaires to appear. So if you have an empty property that's been been out of action for some while, um, Legionnaires is is a potential hazard. So just check out on things on that. Uh, Damp and mould this time of year, tis the season uh, for tenants to just dry their clothes inside. Uh, They may as well just chuck a pint of water at the wall. Um, the other issue with the, with this time of year is tenants wanting to keep their houses or flats warm um, and keep the energy bills low by not opening the windows to ventilate the property. And of course, you know, if you've got moisture in the property, then that's only going to inhibit uh, the the growth of mould. Um, also, I don't think inhibits the right word there, um, enhance the growth of damp and mould in the property. Um, our local council in Buckinghamshire uh, has reported 500% um, increase in complaints about mould and damp. Um, and we, we think this is uh, a, a, a direct link to the cost of energy. So people don't want to be paying so much money. You know, they're, they're trying to save money by turning the thermostat down. And um, 
of course, the, the byproduct of that is uh, an increase in the risk of damp and mould. Um, illegal eviction, we touched on that earlier on. Section 48 and 47. I don't know why I always uh, count down <laughs> when I say those two. Um, but that is for reasons of, I think it's if you move address or if you change uh, change ownership or, or agents, you need to serve the correct notice to the tenant so that they know who to contact or where to write to in, in terms of serving notice. I wonder how, how many landlords right now in, in the webinar that have had uh, arguments with their tenants about mould and damp, <laughs> about condensation, whether it's tenant responsibility or yeah, landlord yeah. responsibility. Uh, we certainly feel your pain if you are if you are someone like that. We certainly to, to have to put a lot of barriers mm. in between tenants and, and our landlords when they come to us saying that the landlord's given me a, a mouldy place and yeah. uh, it's really just, just the way they're living. The fact of the matter is the mould wouldn't be there if, if they weren't there. Mm. Um, we, we actually have a mould prevention guide that we issue with every tenancy and it's in that digital um, envelope that we send out for signature. And it's just, it's just, it's common sense, you know, you use the extraction facilities available, don't dry your clothes um, in a, in a, in a, in, internally if, if you can help it or at least ventilate the room. So yeah, we, we just provide that. And, and whenever we get a, um, a mold or damp issue, we just re, reissue this and just remind them of it. Um, we even kind of start to try and send them out in September, October, just to try and re remind them ahead of the game. But it's, it's a constant battle when it gets to this time of year. Lots of people in the chat feeling our pain. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, shame. Brilliant, brilliant. So, um, yeah, the HMO versus the, the buy to let, multiple lettings versus single lettings, um, and just sort of differences between those types of properties. Uh, obviously, the for those of you who don't know, HMOs, house of multiple occupation, um, we've rented by the room with a communal area that they've shared. Um, there are a lot of differences between the compliance that you need for a HMO and, and for a single let, right? So yeah. um, some things that you might need not think about on a, on a single let is the emergency lighting. Um, you've got to think when, you're, when you've got a HMO and you've got multiple people that don't know each other living in a house, when a fire kicks off um, and they need to get out, they're not really going to go and knock, knock on their neighbor's door um, and, and try and get them out as much as they would do if it was their brother or sister. So the emphasis here is to protect um, protect every individual, contain the fire um, and show them the way out. One of those is the emergency lighting. So if you've got dark corridors in your HMOs with, with lack of sort of natural light, um, your local councils will be sort of enforcing emergency lighting in there so that when the lights turn off or the place is full of smoke, they can see they can see their way out. And it's it's um, it's national guidelines, um, but it's down to local councils interpretation of those national mm. guidelines. Mm. So so we, we're actually based in uh, South Buckinghamshire. We do a, we do a, we manage a lot of HMOs across High Wycombe and Aylesbury. Um, and they're only 20 minutes apart, those two towns, in, by the car. But the uh, the rules for HOs are different. Uh, I don't under even understand that. And apparently the councils have, uh, have, have merged together recently. <laughs> um, and we touched on fire alarms as well. So um, battery operated smoke alarms are compliant for a single let property. If you've got an HMO, you have to you have to have an interlink system. If you have a three story HMO, you have to have a semi commercial fire alarm system with the red smash glass call points and also a fire alarm panel near the fire door uh, front door as well. So these are just the, some of the big differences that you're, you're stepping into if you want to get into HMOs. Uh, they generate a lot more revenue, I suppose you could say, uh, but they do come with their um, additional costs, I suppose. And um, myself and Steve have been looking after HMOs for, uh, well, six years together, uh, f for me, uh, quite a few years longer than that. And um, I think we've, we've been in and out of so many HMOs, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you how many rooms we've, we've looked after. But I think you had a stat about 5,000 altogether at the beginning there. But um, yeah, the, the differences with HMOs and the fines that you can get in with HMOs uh, for non-compliance are, are quite, quite a lot bigger. Um, there's increased um, electrical safety. So it, you've had to have an EICR on an HMO for years, basically. Um, and EICRs came out mandatory for all rental properties in 22, I want to say, a couple of years ago now. Um, so what we're seeing is all the legislation that's in HMOs is slowly slowly filtering out down to um, all rental properties. And as fire alarms have to be 
um, interlinked as a minimum standard in HMOs, we feel it's only going to be uh, a matter of time before that's the case for all rental properties. Um, what else we've we got in here? C2 faults require remedial for satisfactory. Yeah. Uh, oh, you've got the art fault detection devices, which now have to be installed on all new uh, consumer units within HMOs. Um, and that's that's to kind of just trip the circuit if there's any detection of, of, of an arc um, from a faulty appliance potentially, um, uh, which which is basically a fire hazard. So it's just to stop that. Uh, for HMOs, you have to have a notice board. Uh, so we operate a a, a, a a kind of a poster system. So we've got a poster. We're just revamping these at the moment as we speak. Uh, we've got a poster that goes by the front door of all the emergency you know, what to do, information, who to contact in, in, the, in the event of an emergency, um, power cut, what if, what, what if you smell gas, all those types of things. But we've also got a QR code, so one of those codes that you can take a picture of and it'll take you to a, an online um, notice board for the property with a, a bit more specific information for the property, such as, you know, a copy of the compliance documents um, and how some of the appliances may work in the property, when the cleaners come and the bins have changed and all those sorts of things. Um, HMO, managing HMOs, is, it could be potentially likened to professional babysitting. <laughs> um, so there's lots of things in there uh, to be aware of if you're thinking of getting into HMOs. Um, if that is something you are thinking of, I think we still do have the, uh, the cool thing on there. Um, you can you can obviously book in to speak to us about that. Check that up again just to make sure. I think it's still live actually, isn't it? Uh, offers yes it is yeah. it's still low yeah, we'll probably I'm... turn that off in a minute um we're coming to the we're nearly near, near to the end of the, the of the presentation so um we won't keep you guys too much longer uh, so thank you very much for your persistence so... just the uh, last three main things to to consider which we spoke about to the council didn't we last time we we did one of these um we we thought it was useful to to jump onto a member of the council beforehand so we've done it again before this one just to sort of make sure we're giving the most up-to-date information and and they maintain the same stance they had when we did this last quarter um the, the last quarterly uh, webinar and then the main things to look out for are the management regs so your housing health and safety rating system, making sure you're up to date with all of that. If you don't know what that is, you need to get to know. Um, again, book, use the book the call link to, to have a chat to us to, to make sure your house is compliant with that. That one is actively under, under review at the moment. Um, so watch this space. We'll probably have a bit of an update for you on that one, on the next one. On the next webinar, um, that's it. So yeah. So a big bit of um, legislation that's going through Parliament at the minute, which I'm sure most of you would have uh, but found it hard to avoid hearing is the <laughs> renters reform bill yep. so this is the the bit of legislation that's that's been in been been, been started about uh, 2019 um it's had its second hearing in parliament in october last year um i don't really know what the outcome is of that because it, they just keep, seem to keep arguing and i think with the um with the upcoming election or very likely election this year um the, the course of the Renters Reform Bill could change once more. Um, but the proposals for the Renters Reform Bill is that it's very likely to happen. The, um, the abolishment of Section 21 seems to be the main headline grabbing um, line at the moment on there. Um, it will see amendments to the Section 8 for the breaches of contracts. So, so new grounds for nuisance tenants will make it a bit easier to evict people um, that really need to be evicted. Um, periodic tenancies are going to change, so it's, they're going to go from six months to... Uh, yeah, so there's no, no fixed terms. Oh, right. No yeah. fixed term tenancies, just periodic tenancies. Just periodic tenancies. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you, so, so the, the, the flexibility is all on the tenants side of, side of things. They, they can sign a tenancy, stay there one day, leave, and yeah, there's, there's no comeuppance uh, for you as the landlord on them for that. Uh, but but you need to give them <laughs> two months notice um, up. Uh, no, it's currently two months notice. It's in consultation at the minute. So, you know, as, as and when the things become a little bit more clear on that, I think we might have to do a renters reform bill specific um, webinar for, for you guys. Um, Students are seeing a little bit, a little bit more protection. They need to be protected for twelve-month tenancies, and um, 
again, it's all these things, you know. They're, they're talking about it. They, they was, they, there was speak of a, a U-turn on the on the section twenty one, but I think that's back in now. There was a speak on rent caps were, were going to be put into this rentals reform bill as well, but I think there's a potential U-turn on rent caps. Um, I think on the next slide, if I just shimmy across to that one. Um, oh, I'm kind of continuing <laughs> everything I was saying. So uh, cap on rent increases, uh, doubling up on notice periods from one month to two months. Pet considerations. So, mm -hmm. so you're not going to be allowed to say no to a, a tenant if they have um, pets, but you can insist um, that the tenant takes that insurance for that pet. Um, so that's that's one thing. I, I, I don't know how beneficial that's going to be to landlords just yet. Mm -hmm. But um, the da, 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 we're going to be having to justify reasons for not accepting um, leasehold covenants. They'll be for HMOs and leaseholds. Uh, minimum housing standards uh, are going to they're going to be changes to the minimum housing standards. Excuse me. Um, coming across from social housing, uh, you must have access to clean, suitable, usable, usable amenities, to be free from any major health and safety concerns. The property needs to be maintained to a decent condition of repair, state of repair, um, and extending the rent repayment orders to include breaches of this as well. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, a lot of that is pretty standard, you know. I, I think I think we probably speak for a lot of a lot of you that um, as a landlord, you you want to invest in property, you want to create decent accommodation for people. Um, but there are people out there that, that, that skirt around the edges of that. So, so we have quite a good there. question here. Um, just on the pet considerations, we have a good question here at the end um, saying, you can, can you charge higher rents if a pet is on the premises? Well, I would say yes, definitely. Um, it's, it's something that you can consider in terms of wear and tear. There'd be more wear and tear for the, for the, um, for, for, the, for the property so up, upping the rent to consider that would definitely be a case because as we all know when it comes to the end of the tenancy um, the deposit will be looked at and fair wear and tear is, is allowed for but there would be more wear and tear with the pet in there so i would definitely recommend upping your rent yeah. actually if there was a, te uh, a pet in place what you cannot do is increase the deposit mm. you can only take a five weeks value of deposit um, you can't just say to a tenant, you know, what you, what you could do before this, this rule came in was if it was a pet, for example, you could say, yeah, I'll charge you two months rent as a deposit, uh, but you can't do that anymore. Uh, but, but what, yeah, Steve is right. What you, what, you, what you are able to do is negotiate a slightly higher rate of rent to cover that, uh, but you cannot turn around to them and say, yes, you can have a dog or a cat or, or a hamster or whatever uh, and charge them a higher deposit because that would... Um, that would make you non-compliant, and if you needed to repossess the property, you would get thrown out of court. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's more on the rentals reform bill. Sorry. Yeah, there's loads of it, loads of stuff. Coming Steve, Steve prepared these slides <laughs> about me. What did you get this on? So, um, obviously, well, as you can see there, the ban on no DSS, so they're looking big time at discrimination. Um, so they're clamping <clears> down <throat> on, on agents and and landlords being able to just say no because they're taking um, any type of, of benefits. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, you'll have to just keep your keep your eyes open um, and, uh, and and look out for that. Um, landlord register. So this is a big one. This is a money making scheme, isn't it? They're looking yeah. to do. They're looking to bring out a landlord register with a dress scheme for all landlords to be part of, whether you've got an agent in place or not. Um, so there's a lot of question marks around that. So, um, it will have and what this redress scheme will have the power to do is to force landlords to apologize for their tenants for any wrongdoing, um, to take corrective measures, pay up to £25,000 in damages and rent and also um, enforce rent repayment orders. Um, so more hoops to, to, to jump through potentially there. Um, One thing we're trying to find out is if, um, if as a landlord you've instructed an agent, mm. will you come under their redress scheme? So, yeah. so we, we operate under a, um, under a redress scheme. So um, do will all of our landlords also have to operate a redress scheme as well? Seems a bit pointless if we've got a redress scheme in place uh, because we're acting on the landlord's behalf, but that is to be determined by the powers that be. Yeah, yeah there's big arguments on that because 
Um, unfortunately, there are some rogue landlords out there, yeah. um, and uh, unfortunately, as agents, we can't we can't force you to, to spend money. It is your money. We can't act um, on your path on that risk again. So if there are rogue landlords out there, they're trying to protect tenants from, well, the rogue landlords hiding behind agents and things like exactly. that. So it is a gray, it is a gray area. Um, again, like we've said, you know, once it's finalized and there are writing and paper, um, you know, we will uh, do another webinar to, to go over all of that. There are there are campaigners on both sides. So there's, yes, there's campaigners yes. out there supporting the tenants, um, and there's campaigners out there, you know, fighting for the rights of the landlords as well. So, so there's 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 a lot of debate in there, and I think that's why it's just taking so long to get through. Um, I guess ultimately it depends how many landlords sit in the House of Commons um, <laughs> as to what gets decided there. Um, politics um, <laughs> of the reform bill. So the Conservatives pledged the uh, changes to the, to the renters, renters reform, or to, to reform renters, no, to reform the renters uh, way of doing things in 2019, um, and that was to effectively abolish Section 21, um, hence the reform bill going through in the first place. Uh, with the likely general election this year, Labour planned to abolish it, the Section 21 from day one in office. So. We'll, we'll see what happens. I guess if we if we have a general election and if Labour gets power, then as landlords and agents, we'll have a very different way of doing things um, the next day if Labour get into into power. Um, we don't want to get too much into poli politics tonight, but it, either way, um, there's going to be changes to to how you evict tenants. Um, I, I guess fortunately, I can say that we we don't have to deal with it too often. Our, our processes are pretty bulletproof on the way in but sometimes like we said earlier on people um you know relationships break down uh, within the tenancy or people lose their jobs sometimes you, you just you have no option uh, but i think there's, there's a lot to be said for negotiating or managing that, that that conversation throughout before it escalates to court and eviction action uh, but either way there'll be big changes coming up so it's just a, it's to be aware of them and to be prepared for the, what you need to do. Yep, and we have a question here, uh, if you don't mind, very quickly. Uh, we have a problem with ground rents increasing in a block where we have free flats. We rent making properties unsellable. Is this common? Um, yes, I've I've heard a bit of it about this, Michael. So um, it's, it's I, I have heard about. Is, is it a newish development? I don't know if you can type it type that into the chat about about um, how old the property is, but I have heard of developments certainly being built in the last 20, 30 years thereabouts, where the ground rent doubles every five, 10 years. So it's it, when you buy the development, it sounds really cheap, but it doubles and, and then before you know it, it's, it's up to such a rate that um, it actually makes the, the property a bit more difficult to cash flow positively. Um, so yes, I have heard about that um, and a little bit about it, um, not come across it Personally, myself, but I, I am I am aware of, of that as an issue. Um, unfortunately, ground rent and leasehold service charges are not something you can pass on to your residential tenants. I'm afraid mm. to say. Mm. Um, up and coming changes, yeah, about twenty years. Yeah, it does sound about right. So yeah, it was a, it was a big thing that people were doing about twenty years ago, and um, and I think now we're twenty years after that when those leases reformed and um, it's starting to pick up on a few pain points mm. um for people including yourself but um yeah M michael if you wanted to book something and have a chat with us about it we can try and connect you with people that that might know a little bit more to help you out about that um so up and coming changes mm -hmm. we've got a couple more slides left now guys i think um the mees so this is the minimum energy efficient Standards. Standards. <laughs> um, there were proposed changes to get this from an E. This is your EPC rating of an E up to a C um, next year or the year after. Uh, then they extended it to 2028. 20, um, however, farmhouses, blocks of flats and listing buildings were exempt. Um, and then there was going to be a new rating system. Um, it was going to affect 24 million homes that were needing improvement. And it just simply wasn't enforced. Uh, simply was not enforceable or affordable, uh, so it was abolished. So we are back down to an E. So um, we've had some landlords who have gone through with great, great expense to get their property up to a C, and then it's been abolished. But I think that the, mess the, the, the message in the background here is um, 
it's probably going to be something that's going to come in again soon, uh, possibly under new new government uh, later this year. Um, and the other change is to be aware of, obviously, the rent reform bill, uh, the elections are just play out a big landscape for everybody in property. Um, and the how to rent guide issued twice last year. Just make sure you get the newest version so mm. everyone comes out. Um, we do have a link coming up if you want to join our landlord forum. We will post in there if there's a new guide coming out. So if you connect to us in there, you will get the latest information about that as well. Um, and now onto our exclusive offer, which because of the technical issue at the beginning, isn't there for us to push the button it and is. it is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, don't oh, worry, I managed to uh, get that one on there. So this is the second offer. So it's effectively to, to book in another call with us, but this time we're offering a free compliance health check. So we've mm -hmm. got a, many of you may have connected us, connected with us via a health check in the first place, uh, but we'll go through that with you step by step. We'll check, we'll check your compliance basically, make sure that you're running um, compliantly and we'll just make sure that you know where your non-compliance areas are if you have any items of non-compliance that you need to fix up mm -hmm. so yeah just just booking booking on that it'll be with myself steve or um our colleague nathan uh, we'll just run through it with you and just make sure that everything is tickly boo um and that you're not going to fall foul of any of those big fines and that those fines are getting chunky now mm -hmm. i can't believe the uh, the right to rent fines have gone up from three thousand pounds to so twenty thousand pounds is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you do you know that if you don't have a gas certificate, you can go to prison? <laughs> it's a six thousand pound fine. Uh, I mean, actually, I think that's gone up as well. But it, it was a six thousand pound fine, and you can have jail time as well. So just for just for not having a gas certificate. Mm -hmm. But you know, what's what's a gas certificate? Hundred quid these days, less than that sometimes. Um, it's worth it just to have that to avoid the fines, and you, you don't want a house that's going to be unsafe to guess. So yeah, any compliance issues whatsoever, concerns, questions, queries, book in with us, and um, we'll do what we can to help you out. Yeah, and, and the idea of that is to to itemise areas of improvement. So you might be sat back saying, "Oh, you know, I've got everything covered," but do you have time? I think there's over 170 pieces of legislation mm. that we have printed up all over our walls. We've got a legal team, a legal helpline that we're on the phone to every day. Um, we've got a team behind us. You know, do you have time to, do you know, can you name 10 of the legislation pieces um, that you need to abide by? Um, I, I would pose that question to you. So, but the idea behind this is to itemize those areas of improvements. Some of them may come at a cost, especially if you haven't got things like the EICR. Serving the house rent guide that's that's very easy we can do that we can do that quite well, for free um, but any ICR will cost you some money now the idea is not to cost you all of that money the idea is to go through those find the loopholes find the areas of improvements get you to where you need to be and at the end of the day what we'll do is we'll also throw in there um, a, a rent review look at your ASTs we'll make sure that you've got your right to contracts and we'll look at your rents are you at market rate and at the end of the day okay yeah we may have itemized some costs for you but we'll also itemize where you can be in your market rate. Given now that you are providing a compliant property um, up to scratch with the, the standards that tenants expect. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a pretty well-rounded um, half an hour. So um, do, do, do book in on that if, uh, if you feel the need. Yep, brilliant. Um, for those of you still here, thank you very much. There's quite a few of you. Um, Stay updated, connect with us on our landlord forum. We'll send you an email uh, with a link to it. Yes. It's, it's a Facebook group. Uh, I think it's called the Bucks Landlord Forum, and yeah, we're just trying. We're, we're trying to generate a bit of well, increase the activity in there from from us. Certainly. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a safe haven. You see so many times now on Facebook where people are getting into arguments. They're they're slating landlords. They're doing this. They're doing that. My landlord hasn't done this. This is what we're trying to create: is a safe haven for landlords to almost fight back yeah, fight <laughs> or, back. Or, or fight together at Support least. each other. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Ask yeah. a question. What we really want to do is get that community feel. Um, and we want to, uh, we can only do that with, with more of you in there. So um, we keep an eye out for your emails. Like John said, it will be emailed to you um, and yeah, comment or sit back and just, just learn from it. The idea is you can be as, um, engaging with it as you like. If you are quite an outspoken person and like to get people's comments on on what you're up to and how you do things, then that, this is what we're trying to trying to create. So um, yeah, keep your eyes out for that.
Um, we'd be ever so grateful as well. We, I know you've given up your time uh, for us. Um, we have for you. And, and I'd really, really be so grateful if you could just raise your phone and just scan that QR code. It'll take you straight, straight to a Google page where you can leave us a, a, a very quick review. Um, 30 seconds of your time, 30, 30 more seconds of your time would, <laughs> would just go um, so it's such a long way for a, a small company like us uh, to, to try and help you guys out on there. So we really hope that we've provided you some, some golden nuggets tonight. And we really hope that you've taken something away from this evening that will, will just help you maintain your compliance going forward. And ultimately, if, if there's anything in there that you had any questions about, uh, by all means, we're more than happy to speak to you. But um, yeah, if you, if you can leave us a Google review, we would be ever so grateful. So thank you very much in advance for that. Um, we will just go through the questions now, I believe, before we part. So um, a couple of people got some calls booked in. Brilliant. Uh, da, 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 da. A couple of people look at, gonna check out our website. Um, just to let you know, we've got a brand new website coming in a couple of week, a couple of months as well. So um, keep make make sure to bookmark it and come back in a couple of months and see the new all singing all dancing website. We've got some. Um, We've got some return on investment yield calculators if you're looking to buy a property, stamp duty calculators, virtual tours. We've got, we're, we're all into the, the, the virtual video uh, marketing side sort of things. Well, we do get the transcripts of, of the webinar, so we will get all of your comments uh, sent through to us after this uh, at a later date. So what could be really useful is over to you guys um, to sort of say what topics might be good for the next webinar. We try and do these quarterly. Um, we will always do a compliance one just because of yeah, there's so many landlords out there. There's so many people like yourselves here um, that don't have time to go through checklists and things like that and would rather give up an hour, hour and a half um, to sit and, and, and just listen and digest the information that way. So we'll always try and do a compliance one. Now, if there's other topics within the compliance stuff that was that we didn't touch on or some that we didn't cover enough, Fire those into the chat. We'll definitely review it. If we can make a whole webinar out of it, we will do. If we can add some slides onto our current webinar, we will do. Uh, but if you've got some weird and wonderful topics that you just want to know about in the in the private rental sector, um, then let us know and we can put something together. Well, we've had a couple of requests for um, the renters reform bill, specifically, specifically on the renters reform yeah, bill, or yeah. at least a bit more elaborated on that. So, it's a, it's yeah. an ever evolving beast. This renters reform bill. Um, it's being talked about in Parliament sort of all the time. Um, um, and there's always chatter, um, but nothing nothing ever seems to happen right now. It's just being kicked down on the road, isn't it, for yeah, another exactly parliament that. or another um, yeah another yeah, another parliament to deal with. But um, we will certainly keep on touch with that. Any any big any big outbreaks, we'll we'll let you know for sure. Um, I think this is a a, a a statement or is it a question? Um, a carbon monoxide alarms. So we mentioned those earlier on. Um, must be fitted in the same room as the boiler. Yes, they must be fitted in the same room as a boiler or any other gas consuming um, uh, appliance. Mm -hmm. um, would you believe it? A gas hob does not meet that specification. So if your boiler is in, a, in the garage um, and your gas hob is in the kitchen, you do not need a gas, you do not need a carbon monoxide alarm in the kitchen. However, as Steve said, they're only 15 quid thereabouts. So why risk it just in case? Um, the other part of information you might want to know is Carbon monoxide alarms only have to be fitted in habitable rooms. So if your boiler is in your garage or your loft, that's technically speaking not a habitable room. So you may not actually need to have a carbon monoxide alarm in there as per the legislation. However, for the sake of 15, 20 quid, it's almost a case of why wouldn't you? Definitely recommend it, yeah. Um, so I'm just re scanning, skimming through these questions now. If you've got any more, ping them in. I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to those at the end as well. Other things, other topics that we might be able to do um, webinars on. We are we are a lettings agency, as we've sort of uh, told you guys, but we are a one stop shop for all things property. So we do a lot of investment. We do off market deals. Um, for buyers and for sellers. So anyone looking to exit, if they're selling with their tenant in situ, we link with those, with pool of investors and all that kind of stuff. Um, what else do we do? We do furniture packs for HMOs and how to how to make a how to make your best HMO. So we could do a HMO specific webinar yeah, potentially. I think, if, I if think there's HMO would be quite a good one because yeah. it's, it's, it's quite a vast topic, HMO. Um, I've got a couple of questions about, is this recorded? Yes, it is. You'll get a recording sent through to you. Tomorrow or is it 
It's usually 24 hours. 24, 24 hours, hours sometimes so, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, another confirmation about if it's in the garage, you don't need it in there. It's absolutely, you, you're correct. Um, got a question here about my tenants were initially found by an estate agent. Aren't they responsible for the compliance? The estate agent, yes. So, so if you're employing, <clears throat> if you're employing an estate agent um, or a letting agent to find you a tenant, yes, they, they are. Technically speaking, you are paying them to cover mm -hmm. to know all of the legislation and cover that on your behalf. Absolutely. However, if you've employed them as a let only instruction, they will they will provide you a, a compliant tenancy at that point in time. But if you're going to be managing that tenancy going forward, the ongoing compliance will be down to you. So with the changes to um, the fire alarms and the smoke, uh, the carbon monoxide alarms being made compulsory in, I think it was October mm -hmm. last year, was yeah, it? Yeah. Um, that would be down to you to organise. Uh, with any changes to f future you know, um, electrical bits and pieces, that would be down to you to make sure you implement. Uh, it's down to you to basically make sure that you understand what's going on in the market with compliance and you implement those changes to your property. Um, if you have a problem and have to go to court for possession, if you haven't kept up with that compliance and that knowledge and that implementation of those changes, you could fall foul of the system and have your possession order thrown out of court. So mm -hmm. just be wary of that. If you are self-managing, make sure you stay up to date with compliance. That's what this session is all about, really. Just, just maintaining your awareness of it. Um, and obviously we can help you with that um, if you want, if you wanted to. Yeah, like you said, when you go to when you go to court, uh, landlords, it is you and your tenant. It's not not the agent. So what you know, I would always go if you if you're using a different agent uh, other than Hushel, <laughs> I would I would definitely give them a call and I would just say what documents are you serving along with my ASTs? You know, are you getting um, are you getting a copy yourself? Can can you can you see what they're sending out? Are you signing the contracts or are they doing it on your behalf? Do they have the terms of business to say that they can do that? Because uh, ultimately you do need to know should you need to evict anybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's there's no harm in, in giving them a ring and saying, I do know you manage it, but but what are you doing? Are you sending out the how to rent guides? Um, because a lot of agents, sometimes they may not be keeping up to date with the new how to rent guide. Um, you know, it's not like we get it's not like we get um, emailed by the government to let us know. Oh, by the way, agent, this is happening. Um, we have to be actively pursuing these updates. Yeah, we have so, to check uh, in on it. We 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 registered with a few. Um, I, I suppose we're self we we we've self opted to be regulated, so we kind of check in and get a lot of updates from there. Mm -hmm. um, and we we subscribe to a lot of professional bodies um, to get the latest information as well. Um, so I'm just scanning through to see if I've missed any questions. I think we've covered most of it. So there's a, a couple of questions about encountering mold. Um, not always the tenant's fault. So, yes, okay, it's oft, it, it could, you could kind of say that the, the mould is, is, is not always the tenant's fault. It could be partly down to um, the property might not have adequate heating. It might not have adequate ventilation. So that's definitely a factor to consider um, with that side of things. Um, we, we, we had a property recently that's been hugely effective with mould um and uh, in a very short space of time and we went to investigate and they are drying like, i've never seen so much washing being dried in in one room at one time they're boiling the, the way the, the way they're cooking is boiling boiling stuff on the hob so the steam in the property is immense uh long showers uh yeah just anything that can create moisture they are doing in this flat and it's just absolutely expedited the production of mold um so it, it is it is, it is it can be down to the property i think in this particular case the extraction was okay the kitchen extractor could have been a little bit better for the for the cooking side of things but i think it was largely down to uh, the way the tenant was living and and the, i suppose a direct comparison to, to if you've got a tenancy that's experiencing a lot of mold is what was the previous tenancy like but was it mold free so how are they living compared to how are these tenants living that, that have got the mold issues um also you know what what um, what we're trying to say there is as as landlords ourselves we know it's not always you that needs to put your hand in your pocket first of all um so you need to be protected against that because tenants will tenants will ultimately sort of just blame blame landlords and, and try and get out of it any any way they can kind of thing there's a there's a, i think i think this is a question about the 
um, stating that the tenant checks the inventory, checks uh, che checking in the checking that the tenant in the inventory um, check is, is to check the smoke alarm batteries. I think so. Smoke alarm batteries, um, in a, or smoke alarms in general. Uh, if it's an HMO, landlord responsible. If it's a single let property, then or buy to let property, uh, then the tenant is responsible for the changing of the batteries if it's itemized in the tenancy agreement. So it has to be stipulated that it's a contractual obligation of theirs in the tenancy agreement. If your tenancy agreement doesn't specifically state that, you can't you can't technically insist that they do. But what's a battery for a smoke alarm? A couple of quid these days, maybe a bit more. Um, if a tenant's really going to kick up a fuss about that, then maybe they're not the right tenant for, mm. for you. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's their safety at the end of the day. What they're going to do when you increase their rent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly that. So, yeah. so, so I think that kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, brings us to the end of the questions. Mm. I'll just check on mine if there's any. Uh, if the tenant, if the tenant does this, I emailed, do they have to pay to put it right? So um, I think you're referring to what I was talking about with the way the tenants were living in the property with the, the, the clothes drying and the way of their cooking. Um, well, well, yes, if, if it's, it's, a, it's a very gray area, it's a difficult one to define as well. So in this particular scenario, the tenant is paying rent um, on time, in full, there's no problem in that regard. We are advising and educating the tenant all the time. Um, I think we're I think we're agreeing with the tenant in this case that they will be replacing the blinds at their expense, um, and ultimately when they move out, um, we've got it well documented about the condition of the property when they moved in. We will have a well documented report of the condition of the property when they move out. We'll compare the two together, put it for adjudication to the uh, deposit holder, and see which way it is it is determined. Um, so yes, ultimately, I, I think it's down to neglect and um, misuse, really. So, mm. so, but we, so we've had a, we've had a few. We've got a really good relationship with our local authority, our local council, um, in a way where if we do get a tenant keep giving keep you know making a fuss about this mold, we can bang our heads against the wall saying, look, this condensation is not the way you're living. We'll sometimes just ring up the council and just be forthcoming with the information and be like, look got this particular property, particularly difficult tenant that keeps blaming the landlord. Uh, we're going back and forth. What do you think? Can you make a ruling? And they'll come back and they'll send an email going, no, definitely uh, condensation, definitely tenant, yeah. tenant lifestyle. Bang, bingo, there you go, send that off. Um, and we've had that a couple of times, especially over the last three months or so. Yeah, um, yeah exactly that. Uh, so uh, yeah, definitely, definitely spent there for the tenant to, to pay to rectify. I've got a question here from Martin. How do you know if you have all of this compliance in place if the estate agent is running your property? Well, I guess the the, the quick answer is you you, you don't. You, you can only hope that they do. Um, uh, the, the even slightly longer answer, I suppose, would be to have us have, jump on a call with us and we'll, we'll, we'll check it out for you um, just to make sure that they're ticking the boxes with, with everything. So you know, we we do this day in day out. There's you, you, compliance is almost is almost the biggest thing with with managing and renting property. Um, some some agencies might skirt around that, and there are issues where agencies have incurred huge penalties for for non compliance, uh, more so than landlords. And and I think, off almost rightly so, because um, they are managing and protecting your investments your your um your your incomes i suppose as well and mm -hmm. and your liability you know it, on the tenancy don't forget on the tenancy agreement it's not the agent's name on, on the tenancy agreement it's your name as the landlord and the name of the tenant it's not the agent the agent is simply employed by you to act on your behalf so that tenancy agreement's got your name on it so you need to ensure that you are covered and if you don't know the li the liabilities and the compliance of being a landlord, you need to be you need to absolutely make sure that you're instructing an agent that absolutely knows how to do that because it's your name on that document. Ultimately, yeah. you may be able to have you know through your terms of business with your um, with your agent, there will be clauses in there that that stipulate what the agent is responsible for. So that's your your pushback on the agent for their responsibility. Ultimately, the, the tenant's contract is with you.
So mm -hmm. you need to be absolutely making sure that you are protected. Yeah, have a, have a look at your tenancy agreement. What did, it, did, did the agent send you your tenancy agreement? What does it look like? Does it come, come complete in a pack mm -hmm. or is it just the agreement? Um, that's a telltale sign, isn't it? Ours yep. will come in a, in a zip folder because um, it compresses all the documents. There's about eight different documents in ours, maybe even more. Yep. Yeah, because we send every tenant, GASA, EICR, EPC, we send it all to them with their contract um, because then at the end of it, it date stamps it and says that the tenant's seen it. And that is you as a landlord covered. So um, find out how they do your contracts. Uh, see if you, they've sent it to you. If you've signed it, hopefully you have signed it. Yourself. I was just going to say, because there's, there's also a, a potential liability um, of agents signing on behalf of you. Mm -hmm. um, we... we we, we, we can do that on behalf of landlords, but we like, we, we feel it's the landlord's property, it's, it's the landlord's uh, tenancy. We want them to see what we've created for them. Um, so, yeah, if, 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 the, if the agent is signing a tenancy agreement on your behalf, they can do with your authority, um, then just make sure that uh, you're, you're, you know, you're confident in their ability to meet all of the compliance items on there. Uh, right then, oh. I think we're... Will you be asking for us for feedback after this webinar? Um, I think we might be touching base we'll be, with you. Yeah, yes. we'll be following up yeah. with everybody. Um, yes, we, we will be looking for feedback. Um, I mean, the greatest feedback you could give us is a Google review. Google review. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, right. so yes, please, if, if that's okay. If you can give us a five-star feedback on, on tonight's webinar, um, we would be ever so grateful. So thank you very much, Natalie, for raising that very valid question. But Natalie, <laughs> yes, we will be reaching out anyway. So um, we'll, we'll give you all Cool. Yes, but in the meantime, we are. What are we now? We're we're, we're nearly two Look hours that, in. One so. hour forty five minutes. Can't thank you guys enough yeah. for, for giving us uh, your time on a Thursday evening. It's been an absolute pleasure, and there's this by the looks of things still a whole host of you in in the room. So it's yeah. um, it's wicked to see you guys giving us so much support. Hopefully, this has been useful and informative. Like I said, we're going to keep up with this, and we'll keep doing them quarterly. Um, with, oh, actually, do we have the next one? There's a Q and A. We've done that. <laughs> May 2024. So May this May this year, we'll, we, we've said it, put it in the diary. Um, we'll be holding ourselves accountable to making sure we're going to be doing these quarterly. Um, and yeah, if there's any other um, suggestions about what we can add in or go over, we'll, we'll certainly add those. But for now, we'll um, yeah, leave, we'll, you, leave, we'll leave it here. Thanks very much. Enjoy your evenings. Enjoy your dinners if you haven't had them already. <laughs> We're going off for a pint down the pub. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you very much again for your time this evening. And um, yeah, have a lovely evening. Cheers. Take care. Night. Speak to you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.